grace, mercy, and peace be unto you all from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. The text for the message this morning we have heard in Hebrews chapter 13, 1 through 8. Uh, you might want to just keep that both and open to that epistle uh, reading. Uh, I'll be, well, maybe in the spirit, we'll be able to refer to that later in the uh, message. But first I want to tell you something about my teenage years. Those of you who know me know these stories just go somewhere. When I was a teenager, I joined the jacket club, you know. My friends and I considered ourselves a gang, a real gang. We thought we were a gang. We thought we were bad. Don't mess with us, you know. You know, we're, we're bad. Our whole purpose in our existence as a game or as a jacket club, my wife has always said that she's one of them. She's so disgusting with this. <laughs> she's always said, you guys thought you were a game, you were a bunch of wussies. <laughs> our whole purpose was to defy authority, to assert our independence, our freedom. Before your minds now wander too far. And I'll, t I'll tell you, as you've already probably guessed, we weren't bad, not really bad in the way we hear of gang activities these days. Uh, we just wanted to think we were. Uh, we thought we were so bad that the principal of school made us take our jackets off when we got on the school property and walk in and carry them on our arm and put them in our closet. And the threat of expulsion was like a badge of honor to us that we had our jacket on in school. That's, that's the extent of our badge. <laughs> How many here today try to assert your independence and freedom when you were young, when you were growing up? If I pressed each one of you here on the question, I'm sure that you would guess, or I would guess that you would admit to doing these kind of things in your youth that you had exactly the same desires or maybe some done something different. But you wanted to assert your independence from authority. Our culture seeks fulfillment in individual freedom, does it not? Well, it's talking about being free and all that kind of stuff. The 60s expression is even worse today than it still describes today, if it feels good, do it. And it seems like today we have carried that to the greatest degree. Not. Society says that each one of us now can, we, because we've become enlightened, we can make our own moral standards for ourselves. We can establish our own religious system and values. Morality, in the biblical sense, is old fashioned. It's archaic. It's out of date, is it not? We are called bigoted because we stand on those old fashioned moral values. Society and unbeliever, they don't like our values. All of this can be boiled down to one word freedom. Whether these people realize it or not, they're looking to, for and seeking freedom. From God, are they not? In many cases. Our desire for freedom in the world then traps us, traps people, into the ways of the world which only lead to destruction. And the world feels freedom as independence from something, does it not? We're free from that. We are we aren't bound by those rules over there, or whatever it might be. But think about God. He views freedom as love for something. How totally opposite. The world views individuality as life for oneself. For me. See, I'm a member of the Louis. That's what we call ourselves. <laughs> I'm free. And I wear this jacket that's got a, uh, an insignia of a wolf sewed on the jacket that indicates that I'm free from all of your rules. Just symbolizes where we've gone to today. 
But God, uh, God views individuality as life for others, not for me, not for each one of us to say me, myself, and I, but as love and service for others. Isn't that a wonderful contrast? As we study the text, we heard read the epistle for this morning. This is what the writer that Hebrews is telling his listeners. The chapter begins with, keep on loving each other as brothers. Love for one another is the most outstanding marks of Christian faith. It's the new commandment given us by Jesus in John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. Remember these verses, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another first. And his kind of love, not the worldly love he's talking about, of course. And this new commandment, as he calls it, is so important that it is repeated in nine, nine different passages in the New Testament. No other religion puts love for another person ahead of one's own self-interest. Let me repeat that. No other religion in the world puts love for another person ahead of one's own interests. In some way or another, all religions encourage the worshiper to build a Nebuchadnezzar tree for himself. Remember the story of Daniel and the Nebuchadnezzar and the dream that he had? about a tree then uh, which grew up and he called on Daniel to interpret the dream. As Nebuchadnezzar, as Daniel said that the dream signifies as Nebuchadnezzar uh, thought of himself as that tree that covered all his kingdom, overshadowed all his kingdom. And everything revolved in life revolved around him, Nebuchadnezzar. He was the center of everything. That was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's about the person who builds himself up as the center of his or her own universe. Eventually the person's tree comes tumbling down, does it not? It always does, one way or another. Because no tree can feed upon itself. It needs its nourishment from an external source. No person can live in a personal world of freedom in him or herself. God didn't intend life to work this way. Everything we do affects those around us, whether we realize it or not. In some way or another, people are affected positively or negatively by what we do. For the way of the Christian, then, everything in life flows from God's love that flows into us. What we do flows out from that love. Each verse, if you look at that text, each verse in that text is a brief paragraph, like a one-sentence paragraph, touching upon certain Christian moral conduct. Did you notice that when it was read? The action in each begins with a love for others over oneself. Entertaining strangers, as it says there, remembering prisoners, helping those who are ill treated, keeping marriage bonds honorable and undefiled, keeping the value of money and proper perspective it's, are just some of the things that we should do as Christians out of love for others first. But you ask perhaps, how can we love and give so much as the writer of the Hebrew seems to demand? How do we get this much love for others? After all, the world actually mocks this kind of behavior, does it not? 
The answers to our questions are revealed in the larger meaning of verse 8, where it says, I notice I preached on this same verse last week in a whole different context, but it all comes together. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. God is always with us, in other words, in Jesus Christ. He will not forsake us. He will not leave us. God loved each one of us so much, so much, that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, his own son, to carry the burden of our sins to the cross in our place. We can have Jesus only by faith. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and again in chapter 2, verse 7, for in faith, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Those who seek to do God's kind of good, in other words, are seeking immortality and eternal life. And that's how they receive it, by faith. It is Jesus who gives us the Christian freedom. The Christian freedom, as we have seen, is not like the worldly freedom. Christian freedom, then, as we see in these passages, fills us with the love of Christ and empowers us with His love as it flows out from us. You see, God's love is not the kind of love that you can just take in and hold inside. Huh. And a Paul. I got God's love in me. You? <laughs> it doesn't got you. Uh, you see how we might go around and tell other people, I don't got God's love, I don't care about you. And it doesn't work that way. If you can say you got God's love that kind of way, you don't have it. And Paul just stands and responded to me, sure I do. <laughs> sure he does. So you see, it's God's love then that enables us to give true expression of independence and individuality and loving obedience to God's will for us, each one of us in our lives. We enjoy doing God's will spontaneously now, without it being a burden of faith, without it having to be said, God, oh, today I've got to get up, get up and do something in love for somebody else. We just do it because of God's love. Before we even consciously think about our action, what it might be, is something that we ought to do. We've already done. There was a man in the hospital who was to undergo a serious operation. His Christian friends, now I'll just call him Jack and Mary, did everything possible to help the man in the hospital. They invited the man's wife to stay with them while her husband was being operated on. They took the wife to church on Sunday and they prayed and they worshiped with her. Jack and Mary did many other things for the couple while the husband was in the hospital. But about a year later, it happened then that Jack became seriously ill. And he was admitted to a hospital in his, in his friend's town. When Jack's friend then found out, he rushed to the hospital to offer his help to Jack. For all that Jack had done for him and his wife a year earlier. But there he found out that another Christian friend of him, of Jack, had already done all that they could for Jack and his wife. Well, Jack would be in the hospital. And feeling frustrated that Jack's friend from a year earlier said that he wished his brothers in Christ that he could do something for Jack. Jack's reply was, don't return Christ's love to me. Pass it on to someone else. Isn't that it, my friends? That reply is what I think the writer of the Hebrews was trying to teach us, to say our life is to be really like. We have the freedom and love in Christ. We are to use it as, at every opportunity 
opportunity to pass this love on, this freedom on to others. There's a unique thing about this text. Did you notice that there is a sure promise attached to loving Christian behavior? In verse 5, it concludes with that promise, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Jesus simply promises to always be with us. His promise includes the real freedom of a Christian freedom in our lives that gives us the power of his freedom to love others who, as St. Paul said, were even unlovable before Christ. The power he gives us to share his peace and his sure salvation with others. As I've said to you many times when we talk, I talk about the word peace in my messages here before you. I love it when I get done sharing the peace and I come up here and stand and I watch you continuing to hug each other, to love each other, to share Christ's peace with one another, to laugh with each other in the love of Christ. What a wonderful part of worship that is, is it not? God forbid that we would ever forget that part of our worship. And I don't think we will here. Uh, if I said, uh, as I started worship some morning, Okay, today we're not going to share the peace today. Uh, you'd probably throw me out of my ear, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, would, we would surely miss the point of maybe is how much we would miss loving one another. So let's take that love into the world around us. Amen. Amen.